2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thank you, Terry, for reading God's word for us this morning. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for these words you've given to us to study this morning. That speaks of your word. Lord God, we pray that you'd speak to us in this time now. Open our eyes to see you, Lord God, and open our ears to hear from you. And give us the courage to put into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. This morning we resume our series finally on our statement of faith. And today we're looking at our second statement of faith, and it's in regards to the Bible. And we're actually read that statement in just a moment. God's word is important for us because it's how we again find out who God is, our condition and our need for the Savior. There's a story told of a pastor named Joseph Parker, who one Sunday after he had given the sermon, one lady from, his, from her church came up to her and said, Dr. Parker, I want to thank you for, for your sermon this morning. You do throw such wonderful light on the Bible, doctor. Do you know that until this morning, I had always thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were a husband and wife? <laughs> well, if you don't know, Sodom and Gomorrah are not a husband and wife. They're two cities that were destroyed as, as a result of sin. And, it, and it's funny because, and it's sad at the same time too, because it speaks of how a lot of people in the church today don't know God's word. I've talked to many atheists and heard many atheists on different shows talk about how Christians don't know their Bible. They, most of them haven't even read it once. And I'm afraid to say that most of those atheists are true, are, are right. That there are a lot of Christians who have never read through the whole Bible and doesn't know what the Bible says, as we can tell from this little story. It's important for us to know God's word, to study it. Are we going to know everything about God's word and in God's word in our lifetime? Probably not, but we can work towards that still. We can allow the Holy Spirit to teach us in his word, as we'll see this morning. Ignorance for us as Christians is not bliss. Because since we're Christians, we're accountable to God's word. And so we must study it and know it. Allow God to use it to change who we are, to become more like him. So, brothers and sisters, this morning, may we look at these words as a challenge to us to be in God's word daily, studying it, reading it, meditating upon it, so we can again have more appreciation for God and love for him and live rightly for him. Our statement of faith, the second statement in our statement of faith, again, is about the Bible. And read with me these words. We'll just skip the brackets part, um, but we'll read this together. And so this is our statement of faith on God's word. We believe that the Holy Scriptures are God's very spoken word to communicate his love and plan of salvation for all of mankind. The Bible is without error in its original writing and thus is to be believed and obeyed for Christian living and witness. This is an important statement for us because again it says something about that we believe God's word and that it is true. And we're going to look at this morning what this statement actually means in light of his word. So again, we need to understand the significance of God's word 
and how it relates to us as a church. There's a couple points through this we see this morning, and the first is this. The Holy Scriptures, that is the Bible, the Word of God, are God's very spoken word. It is God's very spoken word. I'm going to read for you Matthew 4, verse 4. If you want to write that down. Um, sorry, it's not on the screen there. But Matthew 4, verse 4. If you want to write that down, t- check that verse out later today. But I'm going to read it for you too. And it says this. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of of God. Do we need food to eat? Yes, we do, because we need to sustain our bodies and to do whatever tasks we do through the day. However, as Jesus has said in this verse here, Matthew 4, 4, we can't live by bread alone, but by the very words that come from God's mouth. What are the very words that come from God's mouth? His word, the Bible. One person one asked and said, I wonder what God thinks about. And the reply was, well, we know what God thinks. That's why we have his word, the Bible. The Bible comes from God. He inspired the biblical writers who wrote the Bible. He inspired them with his words to be recorded to all of humanity in order to know him. Every word in God's word is God's word to us. Right from Genesis 1 verse 1 right through the end of Revelation, all these words are for us. Now, yes, we need to understand the Old Testament was written at a period of time to the Jewish people, but we still have it for us to again see who God is and his character. And then the New Testament is written to all mankind for salvation and for us as the church to become the church and to be the people that God has intended us to be before he created this whole world. But the Bible is penned by men. And some people say that, well, the Bible is written by some men and, and some go so far as to say it's desert people and goat herders and sheep herders. Well, that's a faulty argument for one because, well, maybe some of them, yeah, some of them were sheep herders. David, who wrote most of the Psalms, yeah, he was a sheep herder for a time. Desert dwellers, yeah, some of them dwelt in deserts for a while. Elijah did for a part of time. Well, he's not a biblical writer, he's a prophet that was written about. But some of them lived in the desert when they wrote part of God's word. But the point is still, is it's God's word. doesn't matter who wrote who actually penned the words, but it's still God's word because God gave the words to them to write. It's important for us to understand. Now, I know I mean, in seminary they taught, taught us that, well, the biblical writers, they wrote it in, in their personal style and God inspired them to write it. So it's not exactly God's exact words, but it's the point that God wanted to get across. And well, I don't think that's true of God's word. Yes, God used the writer's style, but it is still God's words to us. I remember when we lived in Winnipeg, there was a chiropractor that my wife and, went, and I went to. They were, it was kind of neat. It was actually this kind of kitty corner from our church. So it was kind of easy for us to go to. And Dr. Roth, Rothman? Rothschild. Rothschild? Well, that name's not really that important right now. Anyway, but anyway... We would go there and be sitting in his office until it's our turn to go and see Dr. Rothschild. And oftentimes, his secretary had this little voice recorder, and you could tell it was Dr. Rothschild's voice because he would record his notes on his little recording device, and then his secretary would listen to it and dictate it out, write it out. That's kind of the picture we kind of have of what God did with his word. He inspired he may have spoken the words directly to the author and he wrote, those authors wrote it down so we'd have his word. Again, for the purpose that we can know who he is and how we need him. So the Bible, the, the Holy Scriptures, 
are God's very spoken word to us. The purpose of the scriptures is to communicate his, first of all, his love for us. Remember the words of John 3.16? Can anyone recite those words? Gave his only begotten son. Yeah, shall all perish but have eternal life. Yes, you got it, good. See, John 3.16 is more than just a card at a football stadium, right? <laughs> John 3.16, the words that speak to us, the purpose of God's word is to show his love to us. Secondly, the purpose of the scriptures is to communicate his plan of salvation for all of mankind. Just a word of clarification, though. When we say the word mankind, we mean all of humanity, male and female. Okay? Um, I want to make sure that that's clear because sometimes people get a little funny to that. Oh, what about womankind? Mankind is everyone, okay? <laughs> God's word, the purpose of his word is to communicate his plan of salvation to all of mankind. We see in the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospel story of why Jesus came, his life, his death, and his resurrection. It shows his plan of salvation. And then we have several letters after that. Well, we have the book of Acts first after the gospels. Again, further talking about the gospel and how the church started to grow, how the gospel spread. And then the epistles, letters written by the apostle Paul and Peter and, and others as a means, again, to communicate God's plan of salvation and how we as Christians are now to live. And then Revelation, another wonderful book of the Bible that talks again about God's plan of salvation, but also his plan to take us home to heaven someday. So the purpose of God of the scriptures again is to show his love to us, to communicate it, and his plan of salvation to us. That's the first thing we understand about the Bible. The second thing we learn in our, about God's word from the statement is that the Bible is without error. It is without error in its original writing. Another term we use is called in inerrant. It means there's nothing, no errors, nothing wrong with it. Are there errors in the Bible? No, not in the original writings at all. Are there errors in translation? Unfortunately, there are sometimes. I remember, I can't remember which translation it was that I had that actually I saw two thes in a row. <laughs> Simple, easy mistake, right? So in the translations from the original languages to English or Turkish or Russian or, or Chinese or Japanese or whatever nation in the world, their language, God's Word's been translated into. I think most, most dialects have had God's Word translated into. There's still some that don't have it yet, but most do. There's sometimes errors in the translation, but God's original writings are not wrong. They're without error. They're correct in everything, including when it comes to science. Uh, the Bible is not a science textbook, but there's science in it. Not all science, but some science. And it's hard for some people to believe and understand because some people will believe some really weird things about science. Things that are contrary to God's word. But God's word always stands true. And as scientists continue to study science, they will have eventually at some point realize that God's word is true in where it claims scientific knowledge. We have what's called autographs. Well, we don't have any in hand now anymore. Autographs are, what are the original writing of God's word. So when the person took the pen to paper, that's the original writing of the autographs. But then we also have something called manuscripts. And we have a plethora of those. There are a lot of them. And from those, we can piece together exactly what the Word of God says and then translate it into other languages. 
here's a little bit of a list for you of what we have, of how we are able to put, piece together all of God's word. We have some, and I don't know what all these exactly are. All I know these are copies, manuscripts of God's word. So for the New Testament, we have 307 of what's called uncles. Not the kind of uncles where he's the brother of your, of your parent. Not that kind of uncle. It's a different kind of uncle. It's, there's something called miscules, and there's 2,860 of those. Then lectionaries, there's 2,410 of those. Papyri, 109. The Latin Vulgate, there's 10,000 copies of that. There's something called Ethiopic, which are 2,000, over 2,000 of those. Slavic, 4,101. Aramean, I think these are translations into different languages, but it gives us an idea. Uh, almost 3,000 of those. There's something called Pure Assyric Pasheta. There's over 350 of those. Uh, Boric, there's 100 of those. Arabic, 75. Old Latin, 50 copies of those. Anglo-Saxon copies of God's Word, seven of those. Gothic, six of them. Sogdane, there's three of those. Old Syriac, two. Persian, two. There's another copy in Frankish. For a total of 24,970 copies. And that's just the New Testament. <clears throat> now, I don't know the numbers of all these copies of the Old Testament. One copy we do know totals of is the, called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And those were found just in the last century. <clears throat> and there's 223 of those. Then we have the Septuagint, the Hexpla, Aramaic Targums, the Mishnah, Midrash, and Masoretic texts. Now, that might all sound like Greek to you. <laughs> uh, it's certainly Greek to me, but it's just an example of understanding of the number of copies we have of God's word. And how because of that, we're able to piece back, because we don't have the autographs anymore, we can piece back to what God's word is, the original writing of it. And it's important for you to understand and to know too, the reason why we say there's no errors then is because we understand that based on all those copies put together, there is no theological error. There's consistency through all those copies. And even the book of Isaiah, which is found in um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which was found about 500, the oldest copy goes about 500 years from when Isaiah was originally written. So that's pretty close to when Isaiah was originally written. So we have all these manuscripts. Do you know what other book is the next closest book to have the most manuscripts of? No idea, right? Because it's one you might not even have heard of. It's called the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And the amount of copies, I don't know the exact number right now because I don't have it written down. But what I do know is that the amount of copies are not even nearly close to what we have for the copies of the Bible. Here's the other thing about the Egyptian Book of the Dead. It is, it is not a theological book. It's not a religious book at all. It's a book of spells. And that's the oldest book we have in antiquity with the most copies after the Bible. It's kind of a scene that says, he who has the most copies wins. <laughs> the Bible wins. We know and can see how closely God's word has been preserved from when it was originally written to what we have now. So there can be no doubt for us as Christians that we have God's complete word to us. It hasn't been changed like some people say it has been. No, God's word is, has been preserved and will be till the day he calls us home to heaven. We mentioned earlier, though, in the sermon that we live in a day and age where biblical literacy is very low. It is sad because we have some people who believe things that are completely contrary to God's word, like evolution or Big Bang Theory. Some who have twisted things of God to, be other, to mean other things. 
I saw a little comic strip not too long ago because uh, I was in a conversation with someone online about um, God's word being true and this person had mentioned this comic strip. And this comic strip shows a picture of Jesus talking to his disciples and, and Jesus saying to his disciples, oh, you look to the Bible for the definition of love, but I define love and then read the Bible. Well, there's so many problems with that comic strip, right? <laughs> One, Jesus would have never said something like that to his disciples. Because he is God. He is, part of, he is author of the scriptures. And in his word, he defines love. That comic strip is doing what we call eisegesis. That means we're reading the text, our own ideas into the text. What we're supposed to do with God's word is called exegesis. What exegesis is, is we study God's word and read what it says, find the meaning of it, and then apply it to our lives. That's what any good pastor does when he preaches. He's done the work of exegesis, reading the text, studying it. What does it say? What does it mean? And then how do we apply it to our lives? So when we look at God's word, don't read into it, read out of it. Read it, study it. Ask yourself the question, what is God saying in this passage? What does it mean? And then after you understand what it means, then how do I apply it to my life today? So it's important for us to be biblically literate, to be in God's word daily. There's a traditional saying that says, men do not reject the Bible because it contradicts itself but because it contradicts them. Few words have been true. I've seen this time and time again when someone doesn't like what God's word said and so they want to make it say something else because they want it to fit their ideology instead of what God's ideology is. I actually saw online some time ago there's something called this the Skeptic's Annotated Bible. And they have long lists of what they say are contradictions in the Bible. Well, one day I decided, okay, I'm going to look at the first 10 and see. And I tell you, it didn't take more than 10 minutes to for each of those 10 questions to find that they had misused God's word because they didn't understand the context. They didn't understand what was being said. So we must study God's word, but we must study it properly. Here's a couple of things about God's word not being in error. Since the Bible is without error, the Bible is to be believed. It is to be believed. Second Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, the words that Terry read to us earlier. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. God's word is adequate. It's more than enough to teach and train us to believe right about God, to believe right about salvation. We have many people who believe some really false things about God. And there's some people who believe a lot of false things about salvation. Like there is no hell. Or, oh, I can do good works to earn my way to heaven. God's word is clear. And so we must believe it rightly. And believe what it says about God because it is his words to us. So we can know him. So God's word is to be believed second part of this is that since the Bible is without error, the Bible is to be obeyed. It is to be obeyed. As we read 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17 a moment ago, it speaks to that. We're to obey God's, God's word. We believe it, then we also obey it. And then Psalm 119, verse 105 says this. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my feet. To my path. That's a wonderful psalm to memorize. 
Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Have you ever gone out when it's dark? Maybe you lost something in your vehicle and you had to go in and try to find it. And maybe the lights in your vehicle didn't work. You probably use a flashlight then, right? A flashlight to be able to look in the vehicle to find what you're looking for. Or maybe you're walking out in the dark one night and maybe you're at a camp or something like that or gone camping and it's dark outside and you can't see. You take out a lamp of some kind, a flashlight or, or maybe a Coleman lamp lantern and, and so it can light your path to see where you're going. God's word is like that to us. Remember during our children's moment we mentioned what an acronym for the Bible is? Basic instructions before leaving earth. We're all going to leave earth someday. It's a matter of where we're going to go, heaven or hell. But that's why God gave us his word, the Bible. So we can have those basic instructions before we leave earth. To point us to the way of salvation so we can have an eternity in heaven and escape the consequences of our sin and eternity in hell. So we're to obey God's word. Do what it says. Now, some people say, well, God's word says, though in the Old Testament, you're not supposed to eat shellfish. We need to understand still the context, though, still too. We need to understand that in God's word, law the, of the Old Testament, there's, there's three kinds of laws. There's civil, there's moral, and ceremonial law. The civil and ceremonial laws of the Old Testament, we don't need to follow today because they're not repeated for us in the New Testament as Christ, for, for us as Christians. But the moral law in the Old Testament is still repeated in the New Testament. And that's, the moral law is what shows, that the, shows us that we're sinners in need of salvation. So we still need to obey God's word. So when God's word tells us to study his word, we must study his word. When God tells us to be kind to others, we must be kind. When God tells us not to steal, we must not steal. Yes, we must obey God's word because it is his instructions to us how to attain salvation and how to live our lives rightly for him. What a good God he is. That he would send us his word, the Bible, to teach us, to train us. And yes, sometimes some passages are hard to understand. There's one passage I was reading yesterday. And I'm going, Lord, I'm having difficulty with this one. What does this mean? And so I have to do further study to understand it. But with the Holy Spirit guiding me and studying his word, he'll lead me to the right interpretation so I'll apply it rightly to my life at some point in the future. God's word is so important for us as Christians. I've heard some people say that all oh, you Christians, especially you evangelical ones, you guys, you guys worship the Bible. No, we don't worship the Bible. We worship the God of the Bible. This is his very words to us. That's why they're so dear and important for us. Because it is his love letter, as some have said, to us. It's so that we can know that God is a holy God who is loving and who is truth. Who is willing to take the place of us on the cross for our sins so that we can fully know him and be saved from the consequences of our sins. So as we have read in our statement of faith this morning, our second point about God's word, that the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, are his very spoken word to us. And they are without error in his original writing. His word is to be believed and to be obeyed. Because if we love God, we must want to obey him. Because as God, Jesus has said, if you obey me, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. So may we as Christians believe his word, the Bible. May we read it, study it, meditate upon it. Believe it, and then obey it. Here's some words that were written by Edward Farley. 
from a magazine called Theology Did Today in his article, Can Church Education Be Theological Education? Here's what he writes. Why is it that the vast majority of Christian believers remain largely unexposed to Christian learning, to historical critical studies of the Bible, the content and structure of the great doctrines, to 2,000 years of classic works on the Christian life, to basic disciplines of theology, biblical languages, and ethics? Why do bankers, lawyers, farmers, physicians, homemakers, scientists, salespeople, managers of all sorts, people who carry out all kinds of complicated, complicated tasks in their work and home, remain in literalist elementary school level in their religious understanding? And I'll pause there for a second because there's something here he says they disagree with. He is correct in voicing so far in that the, the rhetorical question of why are people so focused on education but not on educating themselves about God and his word. But for him to say to be, remain literalists, well, I don't know how you get by as a Christian without being a literalist of God's word. Now we understand there are certain parts in God's word that are allegorical or figurative, but the language in God's word tells us when that's the case. Otherwise, God's word is literal, okay? So I want to correct that one thing he says there. But he goes on and says, How is it that high school age church members move easily and quickly into the complex world of computers, foreign languages, DNA, and calculus, and cannot even make a beginning in historical critical interpretation of a single text of scripture? How is it possible one can attend or even teach Sunday school for decades and at the end of that, lack the interpretive skills of someone who has taken three or four weeks of an introductory course in the Bible at a university or seminary. Pretty hard-heading questions he asked, is, doesn't he? Brothers and sisters, we must study God's word. And if we don't know how to study God's word, we need to be trained in how to do that. When I was in Bible college and seminary, I, I swore to God, I said, Lord, since you're calling me into the ministry, my promise to you is that wherever you call me to go, I will teach people how to study your word. Not just to teach it, but how to study it. My youth pastor took a little bit of time with me with that. One week, our Sunday school teacher, who was a fellow student at the Bible college I was going, well, I was, well, I was about to go to, I wasn't there yet, but he had asked me, because it will be between high school and college, he said, would, would you teach Sunday school for the next two Sundays? I'm going to be away. Would you be willing to teach for me? And I, I was honored at that request. I said, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And around my youth pastor said, Let, let's get together then before you do this, your study. Let me talk through with you how to study the Bible in order to teach it. So he equipped me to study. And then went to Bible college and seminary and learned further how to study God's word properly so that I can teach it and preach it properly. I asked myself the question when I was in seminary and Bible college, why is it that so many people in the church don't know how to study God's word? And the simple answer is because pastors and Bible teachers haven't been teaching other Christians how to do it. I don't know how long each of you have been in the church, but I want to apologize to you for pastors who may not have taught you how to study God's word. And don't get me wrong, this is to, not to hack on other pastors. But it's important for us to understand how to study God's word. And as my commitment to you as your pastor that if you're willing to be trained in how to say God's word, I will train you how to do it. So that we can live out this statement of faith that we've looked at today. So we can understand what God's word says. Like the saying says, give a man a fish, he eats for a day. You teach him how to fish, he feeds for life. Brothers and sisters, we must feed on God's word for life. 
So we must study God's word, know how to study it, and apply it to our lives daily. After all, again, God's word teaches us, his word teaches us about salvation and about who God is. Here's the challenge for you this morning. Three challenges I want to give to you. First is believe God's word. As you read it, as you study it, believe it. Because it is God's very word to you. Second point of action is learn how to study the Bible. Again, if you don't know how to study the word, God's word, come to me and I will teach you how to study God's word. We'll work through this big term called hermeneutics. You might wonder what that means. No, it has nothing to do with someone named Herman Newtics. No. <laughs> As the term we use in regards to the science of how to study and interpret God's word. So we'll look at how, how do we read a text? How do we study it? How do we go back to the original languages so we can understand more clearly of what God's word says? The third point of action is this. Read and meditate on the Bible. There are wonderful books out there to read. Wonderful books even about the Bible and, and help us understand the Bible better. But far better to be in God's word. Reading it, meditating upon it, studying it, so that we can allow it to change who we are to be more who God wants us to be. Here's the encouragement to you. The word of God is where we find the hope of God for all of humanity. You want to find hope in these dark days? Read God's word. I'll give you a hint. God's word says we win because he wins. Do you want to know God better and have a deeper relationship with him? Then spend time in his word. It is his love letter to you so that you can know him and draw close to him. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your word that you've given to us. Lord, we have stated correctly in our statement of faith that your word is without error. It is your word, very word to us. And we're to believe it and apply it to our lives. It, was the, it is without error. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful words you've given to us. The way to know you, that you are a holy, loving God, that you are truth, you are light. So, Lord God, we thank you for your word. And, Lord, we commit to you to study it and apply it to our lives. And, Lord, as we read it and study it, may you change us to become more like you. Like the potter who is forming the clay, may you form us through your word. Thank you, Lord God. These things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.